All right, hello, History 362. So for the next three weeks, we're gonna look at the three big Hellenistic kingdoms, the Seleucids, the Antigonids, the Ptolemies, um, and we're going to not only look at their, uh, their uh, scope and scale, their resources, their institutions, their politics, um, we're going to do a bit of a narrative history down to 200 for each of them. Um, and we're going to stop at 200 because that's the, the moment when Rome, having just beaten Hannibal in the Second Punic War, really starts to become a force in Mediterranean, uh, sorry, in, 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 in Hellenistic geopolitics. Um, and therefore, we'll sort of reconvene and talk about the second century and the extraordinary uh, upheavals that that brings. But we're going to be talking really about the three Hellenistic kingdoms during the third century, um, uh, and um, we're going to start with the Seleucids. Um, and the Seleucids are a fascinating uh, dynasty. Um, I've said before, they control uh, what had been the bulk of the old Achaemenid Empire, um, in the words of uh, two historians, uh, Amway Kurt and uh, Sherwin White, uh, they, their, their empire runs from Samarkand to Sardis, um, a huge extent. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's the biggest of the empire, it has probably the largest population of any of the three uh, Hellenistic kingdoms. Um, and not only is it the largest, that gives us the greatest uh, geographic diversity. Um, we're talking the, uh, the highlands of Anatolia, the coast uh, of the Levant, um, the, uh, the rich farmlands of the uh, Fertile Crescent, uh, the rugged Zagros Mountains, and uh, the sort of uh, oftentimes uh, arid um, uh, desert beyond. Um, so uh, a, a wide array of, of uh, geographies that uh, the Seleucids need to be able to project power across. It is also, and this goes back to one of the kind of key themes of the course, Greeks and non-Greeks, um, it's also the most ethnically diverse of the three Hellenistic kingdoms. Um, as uh, the Achaemenids had been this huge multi-ethnic empire, Persians uh, and, and Medes ruling over um, Babylonians and Lydians and Phrygians and, and Elamites. And so, you know, you can make a list of all of the many different peoples that um, uh, the Achaemenids control. Now they fall under the Seleucids. So uh, it, uh, on one hand, we're going to see uh, Seleucids, the, the, the Greco-Macedonian ruling class, um, who uh, form uh, the elite of the cities, who form the core of the Seleucid army, but interacting not just with natives, but with a wide and diverse array of native peoples who speak different languages uh, and have different religions. And indeed, uh, the Seleucid Empire is probably one of the best places to look at the clash between um, Greek and non-Greek. And again, clash may be the wrong word, the interaction. Sometimes, sometimes hostile, sometimes a clash, sometimes um, uh, cooperative and, and uh, uh, integrative, and sometimes something in between. Um, so the, the relationship, the negotiation, interaction between Greek and non-Greek. Um, so uh, we've already talked of the power, the sort of first dynastic transition in which Antiochus the um, first uh, succeeds his father Seleucus the first. Um, and while politically it is a smoothish transition, in the sense that Tychus I had already been co-king, um, had actually married his father's former wife, um, uh, there, are, there is a number of um, uh, uh, crises. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a revolt in Syria, um, and uh, so this, this is a sort of the first sign that the Seleucid Empire, because it's so far flung, um, is also vulnerable to centrifugal forces, um, and that it's, it's going to take strong kings who are active to really hold the empire together militarily um, uh, to prevent different parts of the empire from spinning off into independent entities. And so you could say that one of the, the big problems, one of the, the, uh, the big problems of the Seleucid Empire is space, how to overcome a huge amount of space, especially when we consider the really primitive nature of pre-modern communications. Um, uh, it's been estimated that it takes 
um, about a day to send a messenger with a message 50 miles. And that estimate was made for the Roman imperial post. But I think that basic estimate, it, it, you know, if, it, how, much, how, how quickly can the king transmit information on land? I think 50 miles is, is that's probably about right. Um, and we have this, again, we have this empire from Samarkand to Sardis and even beyond. Um, which means just for the king to try to send a message can take weeks and months. Um, and that's before we consider the return of the message. So how to deal with the problem of space and the intense constraints that space place on the communications of a pre-modern empire. Um, now, in some ways, the solutions fall back on uh, a basic accommodative solution which is to divide that space up into more manageable uh, provinces, which can then be governed by trusted representatives, say, satraps. Um, so the Achaemenid Empire has satrapies, which are the divisions of the empire, and each satrapy is governed by a satrap um, who has sort of the immediate responsibilities for defending that satrapy, uh, extracting taxes and forwarding the necessary taxes to the king, um, and, and generally sort of keeping uh, order within his, or in a few cases, her satrapy. Um, the Seleucids in some ways pick that up, although with modifications. Seleucid governors are actually colloquially still referred to as satraps. It's a kind of Persianism that we, we find in the, the sources. It does seem that they have a, official titles in Greek um, uh, and Generally, they, their official title is strategos, um, a general. So these are generals sent out that, that uh, therefore control garrisons, although they also have uh, a responsibility for uh, an element of civil administration, particularly revenue extraction. So they send out these strategoi um, for some smaller units. Um, the title is eparchos, um, uh, which... Uh, seems to imply a somewhat more civilian administrative subdistrict. Um, but nonetheless, the, the uh, 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 parts of the Seleucid Kingdom are divided up into what I'm going to, as, as, again, as our Greek sources you refer to as satrapies. Um, and so the king can put trusted people, trusted members of his court, in many instances, members of the royal family, in charge of these satrapies. Um, and that way he can trust them to make a number of decisions on their own, um, uh, uh, whether it's making sure that, you know, he doesn't necessarily have to send message after message. He knows that the taxes are going to get collected uh, if there are, uh, you know, foreign invaders coming off the Caspian Sea, they will try to repel them. Um, that's at least how it works in the ideal. Um, so like the Persians, we have these, uh, these satrapies as a way of dividing, governing, making legible, um, uh, the, the vast space of the Seleucid Empire. Um, now, another solution for governing space is urbanization. And this is actually where the Seleucids kind of differ from the account. I've already talked a little bit about Seleucid city founding uh, in, our, in our last week's uh, unit where we talked about kings and cities. The Achaemenids um, had not been big city founders. Um, they, had, they had built cities, uh, royal centers at Persepolis and Pasadardai, um, but by and large, they tend to fall in on the royal centers of the people that they conquer. Susa of the Elamites, Babylon of, uh, of the Babylonians, um, uh, Sardis of the Lydians. These continue to be incredibly important and Achaemenid centers, but the Achaemenids basically say, well, we've conquered you and nice royal capital you've got there. I think we'll use it as a, a, an administrative uh, center. Um, now, the Seleucids do continue to use many of these cities. So Sardis is a big Seleucid uh, city um, uh, center, administrative center, uh, as is, uh, to a degree, Babylon, although the Seleucids uh, also, Seleucus also founds a nearby colony of Seleucia on the Tigris, um, uh, Susa, um, these, these are all cities that continue to be used. Um, but the Seleucids, uh, starting with Seleucus the first Nicator, the Seleucus the victor, um, show a real preference for founding new cities 
Um, and these cities are settled with a core of Greco-Macedonian immigrants, frequently former uh, soldiers and mercenaries. Um, and these cities provide uh, the um, uh, kind of, uh, it's a way of, again, organizing the vast geography. Um, now, as I've sort of mentioned, the four most important cities are the Tetropolis, in, uh, in Syria. And, and of these, the kind of preeminent city will be Antioch, um, uh, uh, and uh, Antioch on the Orontes River. But there are, uh, and this is where things can get confusing, there are many, many Antiochs and Seleucias um, and Apameas, um, all dynastic names, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Laodiceas, uh, the uh, Apamea and, and Laodicea named after queens, Antioch and, and um, uh, Seleucia's uh, named after kings, Antiochus and Seleucus. Um, th th there are cities with these names scattered across the Seleucid Empire. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and often are referred to um, uh, uh, geographically. Um, there's, there's an Apamea in uh, Pisidia um, uh, and an Apamea um, in Syria, for example. Um, so um, these cities do a number of things. One, the people who are inhabiting the city, the, the people who are found, who are settled there as the as the citizens of the polis, um, many of them are given land grants because they're former soldiers that require them to continue to serve as soldiers in the Seleucid army. Um, they are clerics or katoikoi. Um, uh, um, uh, referring to the actual land grant. Um, so these cities are all nodes of recruitment. Um, and again, when, this is also convenient because a Seleucid king doesn't actually have to go to a, an individual soldier and say, I need you, I need you. He just can tell the city, hey, send me a military contingent from the people, uh, you know, from the, from the, the katoikoi uh, or the, uh, the clerikoi in the, in the city. And they can't. So that right there, cities are, and, and I stress this when we talk about kings and cities, they're convenient nodes of interaction um, that allow, because they have their own administration, they can administer those settlers, those citizen soldiers for the king um, so that he doesn't have to. Um, cities are also really important as tax collecting entities. Um, and indeed, it's not uncommon for a king to grant land to a favorite, somebody who's done good work for him, a, a loyal courtier, um, to give him a land grant and say, guess what? A wonderful condition of this grant is I will let you choose the city that you attach this land to. So it could be a huge estate off in the middle of nowhere say, guess what? You can attach it to whatever city you want. And that the, the, the taxes that you pay off this land will go through that city it's a benefit to the city because they get a cut to build their gymnasia or um, uh, you know, water systems or, or temple or whatever they want to build. But then it still goes to me through the city. So the, the cities themselves are, 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 are important ways of tracking land, tracking tax obligations. And because the cities do that, guess what? The king doesn't have to. He, he, can, he can fall back on the administrative capacity of any of these cities that, frequent, that again, he's founded to help him control, organize, make legible that space, the vast amounts of space that he's got. Um, uh, cities also uh, are economic hubs. Um, uh, they, uh, in many instances, will uh, mint money, although Seleucid Salus kings themselves have Western and Eastern mints where they produce uh, uh, coins, uh, probably largely to pay their armies. But cities also, um, mint money, control markets are, are, are major nodes of, again, of, of economic exchange. Um, and of course, that economic activity only benefits the king without him having to do anything. Um, so the foundation of cities um, uh, is incredibly important. Um, sometimes the Seleucids also found settlements, Katoikia, um, that are, are not fully cities. That is, they don't fully have the apparatus of a, of a polis, uh, and that would be the, you know, the, 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 the governance, the, the, the monumental architecture. Uh, Katoikia are, are much are just very small, and they're more like a kind of village. But there are also places where kings can put 
military uh, settlers, grant them land in exchange for military obligations. Um, and so there are a lot of these scattered about as well, in addition to the big poles, um, most of which are founded afresh by the Seleucid kings. And of course, all of these, both the poles and the and, and, and the Cryptokia, um, uh, uh, they are um, they, they act as garrisons. That they the fact that you have these military settlers who continue to have military obligations, have therefore military training and experience and, and, and weapons. Um, these are people who also can help keep the non-Greek population down. Um, and indeed, um, in some instances, including when we get to the second century in, in Jerusalem, um, one thing that you can do in the face of a revolt or civic unrest is plop a colony down um, uh, of, of soldiers uh, as a way of both punishing a rebellious community or a, a community that's, that's been out of control. And also, again, uh, that city kind of serves as a, as a garrison because it has your armed people um, as its inhabitants. So city foundation, particularly important to the Seleucids. Um, as we'll see, the, the Ptolemies have a few big cities, but for the most part, um, uh, 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 the Egyptian countryside is, is, is not going to be urbanized. Um, the Antigonids already have both their internal urban infrastructure and the Greek city-states that they seek to exert hegemony over, the Seleucids found a ton of new cities uh, afresh as a way of controlling this kind of native space that they've fallen into. So uh, if there's one thing that kind of sets the, the Seleucids apart, um, and not exclusively, but it's their, their big city founders. Um, one other solution to the problem of space is movement. Seleucid kings are incredibly mobile. They move, they're the good ones, the energetic ones, um, move around their kingdom um, in these long royal peregrinations. Um, and in doing that, they, they exert and re-exert control over territory. And I, and I think that's sort of important. Seleucid power has to be constantly reconstituted, constantly re-exerted. And one way to do that is for the king to move through space, usually accompanied by a sizable army. In a few instances, these campaigns, um, uh, particularly those a few that are launched in the east, may consist of, of you know close to a hundred thousand soldiers. Um, uh, now, there is an element of coercion in this, in that when kings move through their territory, they're showing off. Look at look at me. Look at my huge army. Look at the fact that I can move this huge army into past your community. Be clear, there is a reminder of, hey, keep paying your taxes because right now I'm coming through peacefully, but I don't necessarily have to. Um, sometimes these royal movements also involve more, though, than raw coercion. So when kings go anywhere, this is actually true for all Hellenistic kings, people come to them to settle disputes. They are constantly, they're almost overwhelmed by petitioners. Um, and so for a king to move through your territory um, where there might be sort of disputes and grievances and problems that the local authorities aren't dealing with, this is actually one chance for the king to kind of come through and be an outside um, arbiter. Um, and again, in doing that also makes at least the winners um, sort of grateful that the king came through and solved their problems. Um, also when kings come through, Frequently, there's a big party. So the king comes through with his army. Um, people, on one hand, this is this is a resource suck because people are bringing out food, providing rations for the army, providing uh, high quality goods for the court. But oftentimes, it seems that there are these sort of huge kind of movable feasts where uh, the you know locals kick in huge amounts of food. Local aristocrats, uh, you know, who want to make a splash before the king, bring huge amounts of food. And then whole communities kind of come together and feast as the king moves through. Oftentimes, you know, they bring a bunch of stuff for the, for the king, but then they get to have some of it in this kind of big party. So this sort of huge feasting on, on possibly a grand scale. Some of this, I can't take, and the Achaemenids do this too, actually. This is a rather Achaemenid thing that the Seleucid kings are doing. Um, this is another way of constituting and reconstituting royal power. So again, uh, aggressive and effective kings move through their kingdom as frequently as possible 
um, uh, as a way of exerting themselves. They don't just stay in their uh, 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 royal centers. And actually, you know, one, one thing I'll just sort of close on, it's always tempting to say, well, what's the capital city of, of this kingdom? I mean, Macedonian kings have, have Pella, which is a, a royal center. Um, uh, Ptolemaic kings, it's actually pretty clear that Alexandria is by far and away the most preeminent city and where they reside and where the, where the necropolis is. And if that's the, that's the capital, uh, if we have to impose that term upon the Ptolemies, it's really hard to say if um, the Seleucids have a true capital. There are some royal centers that are more important than others, particularly Antioch, uh, particularly Seleucia on the Tigris. It is true that the uh, the dynasty's necropolis was initially going to well, is initially in uh, Seleucia uh, Praera, uh, Seleucia on the coast. Um, but then, embarrassingly, it gets captured by the Ptolemies and the Seleucids are fine, life goes on. So the Seleucids don't really have a capital. Um, Seleucid kings move from royal center to royal center, they move around their kingdom. And I think we can really truly say that the capital of the Seleucid kingdom is where the king happens to be. Um, uh, uh, and he needs to keep moving because oftentimes he has to come to his kingdom rather than having his kingdom come to him. So on that note, um, let's end it there. The next time we'll talk a little bit about the Seleucid court and army, that is the institutions of Seleucid power. I'll see you then.